flying fish are an incredible group of animals that are able to leave their watery habitats behind and soar across truly remarkable distances in the air. It's a fascinating adaptation for fish to have. But just why do they do this? And how exactly did this utterly amazing feat of nature evolve in the first place? Inhabiting every ocean and favouring the warmer tropical regions, flying fish have enlarged pectoral fins that are utilised as wings in order to enable these organisms to glide above the water's surface. The tails of flying fish are distinctive, with the lower lobe being more extended than the upper one, and in certain species the pelvic fins are enlarged in addition to the pectorals, giving these fish four wings they can use to glide. Not only this, but adaptations of the vertebral column strengthen these animals' backs and make them very rigid, aiding in their aerodynamics and improving the amount of control they have over their flight. The tail, too, has adaptations that strengthens it a great deal and provides enough power to allow the fish to clear the water and start gliding. The way in which these organisms take off involves them first swimming at high speeds close to the surface of the water, until they achieve a velocity of around 37 miles per hour, at which stage they point themselves upwards and exit the water. The powerful tails are then used by the flying fish to taxi, beating them from side to side just underneath the water while most of the body is still above it, and then they fully take to the air using their wings. In the longest recorded single glides, these creatures can cover an incredible 180 meters or more, which is about 600 feet, using updrafts to extend their time in the air. After one glide, the fish can then return to taxiing just above the water again, before taking off once more and starting another glide. By using this method, flying fish have been capable of travelling 400 meters, or about 1300 feet. There are a great many different kinds of flying fish alive today, and they are all grouped together in a family known as Exocetidae. The exact number of species said to be within Exocetidae varies from source to source, but currently there are about 70 different species of flying fish recognised, in about 7 genera. These genera are Chylopogon, which includes about 29 accepted species, such as the Atlantic flying fish, Kypsilurus, in which there are about 12 accepted species, Exocetus, which contains around 5 species, including the blue flying fish, which was the first of these animals to be described by Linnaeus himself in 1758, Fodiata, with 2 species, Hyrundichthys, containing 12 species, Paraxocetus, with 3, and finally Prognichthys, which includes six different species. So this is a fairly diverse group of animals, but how does the whole Exocetid family itself fit into the Great Tree of Life? Exocetidae is classified within the Belloniformes, an order that includes families such as the Needlefish and the Halfbeaks, as well as several others. The Belloniformes are a clade contained within Actinopterygii, or the ray-finned fish, which is itself a division of the bony fish, Interestingly, gliding amongst modern ray-finned fish is actually not restricted to just the exocetid flying fish group. In fact, there's a very closely related grouping that have some gliding members too. Certain species of half-beaks, another kind of biloniform, are also known to leap out of the water and glide in a similar fashion to flying fish. This family, technically called Hemiramphidae, is actually the sister clade to Exocetidae, and most members of the group possess an elongated lower jaw that flying fish do not have. The flying half-beaks favour relatively shallow waters in tropical regions, and can also travel considerable distances when in the air. In order to properly examine the evolution of the Exocetids, it's important to first understand why these fish take to the skies, and therefore figure out what the selection pressure must have been to cause this remarkable behaviour and anatomy to arise. It has been suggested in the past that flying fish might fly either as part of an energy-saving method of locomotion, or to avoid and escape predators. A 1992 study examined the muscle structure of exocetid tails, and compared them to those of other groups, and suggested that the increase in speed of these animals just before they take off is actually a fairly inefficient process therefore providing evidence against the idea that gliding helps to save energy. Today, it's generally accepted that flying fish do indeed glide above the water to escape from predators below, and there is some good evidence in support of this. Starting with the observations of a naturalist in 1906 who witnessed dolphins chasing down schools of flying fish that leapt from the water to evade them, there have been many different reports since then of sharks, tuna, and cetaceans such as dolphins and porpoises seen pursuing exocetids and these animals are known to be sources of food for marlins, dolphinfish, squid, and birds. 
Additionally, the lateral line of flying fish, a system of sensory organs that enables the animals to detect movement in the water, is actually placed much lower down on the sides of the body in this grouping compared to other fish clades, allowing for better identification of threats from below, which adds even more support to the idea that exocetids leave the water to escape predators. So, now we know what the most probable selection pressure on these animals was, and therefore we can understand why those individuals better at leaving the water behind were more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on their genetic information. But what exactly would this evolution have looked like? German evolutionary biologist Ulrich Kuchera published an interesting hypothesis in 2005 in the Annals of the History and Philosophy of Biology that suggests a potential pathway the ancestors of the exocetids took to produce the modern flying fish we see today, and so here we'll be exploring this idea of flying fish evolution. By using observations of modern species, as well as anatomical and genetic examinations, it's possible to reconstruct a view of what hypothetical missing links in exocetid evolution may have been like. The family of fish known as Cyprinidae, which encompasses carps and minnows, contains some members that have actually been known to walk on the surface of water in order to escape predators. These include the genera Pelicus and Albumus, which usually inhabit the upper 10 centimeters of water, and have a forked tail with a lower lobe that is extended slightly further than the upper one. According to this hypothesis then, these taxa could represent what the ancestral condition of flying fish was like, starting with some species jumping out and walking on top of the water for a short period of time to avoid predation. The half-beaks could then represent another transitional period in the evolution of Exocetidae, with some members gliding in a similar fashion to the true flying fish. However, there's a particular genus of half-beak, Oxyparamphus, that has been suggested by past studies to potentially represent an intermediate form between this grouping and Exocetidae. Using morphological evidence, such as the forked tail with a lower lobe extended much further than the upper one, the longer, more wing-like pectoral fins compared to most other half-beaks, and the interesting point that this animal only has the characteristic longer lower jaw when it is a juvenile before losing it as an adult, previous studies have placed Oxyparamphus as a basal exocetid. On the other hand, molecular data led another study to conclude that this genus is actually a half-beak, suggesting that this is a living example of what the intermediate stage between half-beak-like ancestors and the more derived flying fish would have been like. Within the Exocetidae family itself, researchers have also recognised two distinct groups, splitting the family into the more basal, or primitive, two-wingers, which mainly use the expanded pectoral fins, and the more derived four-wingers, which employ the use of both the pectoral and pelvic fins. Various studies have concluded that the two-wingers are the least sophisticated at gliding, and therefore have suggested these genera be positioned nearer to the base of the exocetid family than the four-wingers, which are presumed to have then evolved from two-winged ancestors, and seem to represent the current pinnacle of flying fish innovation. So, what could be next? Perhaps, if these organisms continue to be under increasing pressure to escape the water for longer and longer periods of time, we could be seeing the early stages of the evolution of real-life flesh. These hypothetical creatures, featured in the world of the speculative zoology project The Future is Wild, are powered flight-capable fish that have completely left the ocean habitats, though the ocean flesh returns there to hunt. The flish appear about 200 million years in the future, and in addition to the ocean flish, there's also a forest flish. These animals essentially replace birds, which have become extinct by this time, opening up all kinds of niches for these new flyers to exploit. Whether this is a realistic future for the evolution of Exocetidae is obviously questionable, since so far only gliding flight is possible in this group, and the fish are still restricted to water for the most part, as this is where they feed. It's just a fun thought to consider, but what are your predictions for the future evolution of exocetids? Let me know in the comments. It may also be worth briefly mentioning that in addition to the true flying fish and some half-beaks, freshwater butterfly fish and freshwater hatchet fish are known to leap from the water in order to escape predators. Freshwater butterfly fish are allegedly reported to be capable of gliding for short distances above the water after jumping out at high speeds, though other sources suggest they are not proper gliders, but ballistic jumpers. They apparently do flap their pectoral fins as they jump though, using expanded pectoral muscles to propel themselves out of the water, instead of the forked tail method of exocetids. 
Freshwater hatchet fish, which are not particularly closely related to the butterfly fish, use a similar technique to exit the water, employing the use of their large sternal region and powerful muscles that drive their pectoral fins. This is again likely a predator evasion technique, and since both of these fish are neither closely related to each other or to true flying fish, it's a great example of evolutionary convergence resulting in a similar solution to the same selection pressure. But the convergence doesn't stop there. There's actually another group of fish, named Thoracopteridae, which lived during the Triassic period and were also capable of gliding above the water. This lineage is completely unrelated to modern exocetids, and were extinct by the Jurassic, whereas the fossil record for exocetidae goes no further than the Eocene. But nevertheless, there are some fascinating similarities between the two groups. First of all, Thoracopterids also possessed well-developed enlarged fins that acted as wings for gliding. They additionally even had the characteristic forked tail with an extended lower lobe, suggesting that these animals too used the same method of exiting the waters today's flying fish do, an even more remarkable example of convergence in action. So why did this happen in another group? Well, probably for the same reason as exocetids, to escape predators in the waters beneath them. A genus and species of Thoracopterid described in 2012 was discovered in Middle Triassic Age rocks in China, and in this same locality and of the same age, there are also fossils of marine reptiles such as ichthyosaurs and nothosaurs, predators that would likely have hunted these fish. More recent discoveries of thoracopterids that appear to be intermediate between different forms have enabled a clearer picture of the group's evolution to be attained, and could potentially also aid us in deducing how exocetidae evolved. For example, the 2015 description of the most basal thoracopterid known, Wusha ichthys, proposes a four-stage, gradual evolutionary change leading to the ability to glide. This particular species displays some characteristic features of the skull seen in later members of the group, while lacking the prominently elongated lower tail lobe and enlarged fins. Then there's another species, Peripeltopleurus, which seems to be a transitional form between Wusha ichthys-like animals and more derived members, as it has a slightly lengthened lower lobe, but the wings are still reduced. In later species, the fins become better suited as flight surfaces, the tail lobes become even more asymmetrical, and, eventually, scales are reduced. So, it's suggested in this paper that the first of four stages in thoracopterid evolution was the adaptation of certain cranial features that enabled the organisms to be better suited at inhabiting surface waters. Next, the forked tails developed to help them take off from the water, followed by the enlargement of the fins to help with better gliding abilities. Finally, the scales on the fish became reduced in some species, improving their aerodynamics. Therefore, using both observations of modern species that potentially represent past stages in the evolution of exocetidae, as well as comparisons with thoracopterid evolution, we can get a pretty good understanding of how exactly this fascinating branch on the great tree of life came to be, and the reasons why. Where they are going next is an intriguing and compelling discussion too, but whatever behaviours and morphologies they end up evolving, hopefully the exocetids will be around for a long time into the future. I really enjoyed researching for this video and learning all sorts of new things about these incredible animals, so thank you very much to Sam Bricky for suggesting I make a video on this topic. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new too. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.